Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 153 for Monday, February 12th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to uh gig gap the working musicians podcast <laughs> the podcast by for and about working musicians here in durham new hampshire but in like the opposite spot of durham i moved my podcasting podcasting desk around and things are a little weird i'm dave hamilton hey out in las gatas california it's paul kent i think i think dave your um your body is is roughly in the same metaphysical space but your i think your mind is a little bit expanded right now is that right it's possible yeah i'm i'm also taking uh flexoril for that's what i mean <laughs> hurting my back yeah 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 uh, but Dude. no but seriously i'm turned around like my back used to face the other way so i i moved my desk before i hurt my back disoriented a little right really disoriented and my mic's on the other side that's the part that's the strangest uh. thing yeah yeah. But anyway, dude, you got to take care of yourself, man. Uh, you know, I, my suggestion about that whole uh, slipping on the ice thing, move to California. It's been like 70 degrees for the past two weeks, three weeks. And it's lovely. You know, when I and I and that is sort of how I hurt my back. It's certainly how this started. Um, I slipped on the ice while it was snowing uh, in my driveway last week. And uh, I and it totally took the wind out of me. And as I was like on all fours on the ice, I, I was thinking, I, why do I live here? Why do I do this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. But anyway. You got to take care of yourself, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am. And it's, it is getting better, believe it or not. So there you go. On Friday afternoon, I could not have done this podcast because I literally wow. couldn't talk. Yeah. It was because it hurt yep. so much. Yeah. Youch is right. Hang in there. Uh, you know, that, that reminds me though, like if I had gone, say on a Caribbean vacation, uh, I would not have slipped on the ice and I would have been Okay. And I meant to bring this up last show, but, you know, as usual, Paul, we got totally derailed with everything. But um, I don't know, about six or eight months ago, uh, my friend Suzanne, whose band I filled in with a couple of times over the summer, uh, their band was called Sea Rock, or I, I think it's changed. But anyway, um, she posted on Facebook. She said, I'm going to Costa Rica. And... Uh, you know, like she goes all the time, like, it, like once a year, at least she, and she, so she was posting, I think it's time to plan another Costa Rica vacation. And she said, but you know, the thing that I miss while I'm away is I don't get to play gigs. Like that's my leisure activity. And I have to leave that at home when I go on vacations. She said, I don't want to do that. What musicians want to book a trip with me and, uh, let me know. We'll put together a band and we'll play. And I thought, well, what an interesting thing, well, whatever, you know, and I just sort of let it go. And then over the course of, you know, certainly the last six or eight weeks, things started to heat up and it was like, well, wait, she's got like a drum. She had like a six piece band, guitar, drums, her singing. Uh, she had a horn player, a keyboard player. And uh, and they all it looked like they rented a house down in, in Costa Rica together and uh -huh. they, they booked they booked like three or four gigs before they left. And then while they were there, I think they picked up another one or two. They, I think they played a gig every night of their vacation. Oh, yeah. but so was the net net of this a, a, a basically a, a free vacation, like a working vacation, or was the net net of this a financial positive? Uh, I don't actually, I don't, I don't know how finance has played into it based on the way she was talking about it. And the rest of them were talking about it on Facebook. This was, this was probably a financial loss. I mean, it was a, it was a vacation and part of what they wanted to do on vacation was play gigs. So Got it. I, I don't, I, I honestly, I don't know how they negotiated with these clubs. They probably did get something out of it. I mean, if free drinks, I would assume if nothing else, you know, which for evenings on vacation, that might actually offset some significant costs depending on how big of a drinker you are. But um, so, you know, the premise of this is really fascinating to me. I mean, I, 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 having tried to figure out how to do this, but mostly running up against the issues of, of travel and housing costs for a 10 piece band is been like, so about four hours from here is Lake Tahoe. Right. Right. So that's a, you know, that's a place where people would go for vacation. It's, you know, far enough away where it's away. It's fantastic up there. Beautiful, you know, it's gorgeous. but mostly, yeah. The, you know, the problem I get into is, is lodging, 
you know, the cost for lodging for a 10 so, piece so band. This was whatever it was, six people, I think, um, that all paid their own way near as I can tell. Like, I don't think it was it certainly when she started the planning of this, it was come on, vac- plan your own vacation to the same spot as me at the same time as me. And you, I'll book some gigs. You pay your own way. I'll book some gigs. Now, whether it evolved from there into it being, you know, some financial offset or something based on the money from the gigs, I don't know, like I said. But but this was not a, I want to bring this specific band. It was what musicians are willing to take this flyer with me. Did and, they rehearse? Uh, yeah, they did. She posted a video of them rehearsing. Uh, before they left. Before they left. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Yeah. I know. So a lot of interesting things here. So let, let me just color this. So I know bands locally here <clears throat> who have been flown to cool places for corporate gigs. Right? Totally. Yep. So, you know, some company around here has a favorite band that's played some of their uh, local events or they've seen and they're like, oh, I want you to be part of my national sales conference or whatever it may be. And so they've flown. And those are like the biggest one I know is like a five or six piece band, Hawaii, Orlando, um, so that's one model is to have somebody totally pick up, you know, the, the cost. And I guess, you know, you have to understand the chain of decision making that like usually um, big company X will hire a, a an events company sure. to go out and handle all of the moving parts of, you know, the national sales conference or, you know, user conference, developer conference, whatever it may be. So whatever it that's, is. that's right. Yep. Uh Oh, Paul. Uh, well, I think I lost you. Are you back? I'm here. Okay. That was weird. I never left. Okay. Well, I have you back now. So that's the good news. So all right, well, uh, you said they hire an events company to handle all the moving parts and that's that. Yeah. And that's, that's one model of it. And, you know, you as the band, you either give them a, the events company, a writer, and they make sure the sound is there and whatever things you got to rent you know, instrumentation. That's one model. But I also have a friend who um, does basically what your friend did. And they say, listen, I want to do a working vacation. You know, I want to kind of, you know, raise a little bit of money to offset the cost of vacation, but I want to go have some fun and I want to go play while I'm on vacation. And so him and his band, uh, they've done two things. They've gone to Laredo, Mexico, and they've gone to Cabo. The one at Cabo, there's some connection to Sammy Hagar's club there. Sure. And they get a weekend booked. You know, they do it months in advance. And they try and get a bunch of fans to go down. I don't know how well that goes, that they actually get a following to go down. I mean, they have, they have a decent following, but I don't think that that's really the main part of it is that they guarantee the club that they're going to bring you know new people or anything like that yeah, I don't in, think in that vacation happens. spots clubs tend not to have trouble like attracting people that true. just want to show up yep yeah true um you know but the other model when they go to laredo which is a vacation spot for one of the guys i think he just made friends with the local you know beach bar and, and yeah. he says can i bring a band down and you know i don't know i don't know what the finances are there either but that concept of doing a working vacation i think it's awesome for my band, you know, there's significant others that got to figure out, you know, so, you know, renting a house solves the problem to a great degree for a four or five, maybe six piece band. But once you get to 10 pieces and, you know, everybody wants their own room and all that type of thing, it's just been really unwieldy difficult yeah. to kind of make that thing happen. And, uh, and actually, I just went through this with my band where we got a gig offer about two hours away. Now on the East coast, I don't know. Would you drive two hours for a gig for a standard gig? Or is that, is that outside your limit? Uh, That's about my limit, but it would have to be, there would have to be extenuating payment circumstances or other circumstances that said, yeah, it's worth going and doing this gig. Yeah. But otherwise, sure. Yeah. So this gig for us, two hours away. And, uh, you know, I want to kind of break in this new market. So, you know, we have, we're, you know, we saturate where we are. We, we play all the time where we live. We have one other about, <clears throat> about 50 minutes away, which, you know, around here is, is a pretty, pretty decent distance that we've built a good audience there. We have, uh, so that's east of us. We still have plenty of opportunities south of us. That'd be Monterey, you know, down Carmel, that area that we don't do much business there. We actually don't do much business on the San Francisco Peninsula. So, you know, know the area. So kind of Palo Alto, San Mateo, San Carlos, South San Francisco up there. And we just do very selected, usually corporate gigs. We don't have an audience base in San sure. Francisco, so we don't have that. And then there's Sacramento, which is about two, two and a half hours away. So um, 
there there are there are gig opportunities up there um, and there's really good clubs up there and if you know i wanted to kind of develop a market so we got a gig offer and I put it to the guys um, and because it's different, you know, like I think I've shared before, most of the time I say a gig is booked, you know, here's the pay be there. We've already negotiated that if um, within a certain radius X pay, I don't got to get it approved. You know, I don't got to sure. ask. I can just it's say just a gig book, a done you know, deal. Yep. And, and then, you know, 40 to 80 miles is another, you know, minimum gig pay as long as I meet that you know requirement it's a done deal and then over 80 miles is another one so yes, this was I, a little I don't, bit different I don't, I don't want to gloss over that because that's a really important like procedural pr- thing it's like an important process to have in place to keep your band functional and not to hamstring your leader or booking agent or whoever it is having that conversation up front or even evolving it as your band goes but but yes. having the like Okay, we all agree with these parameters, it's a yes. And with, you know, with these parameters, it's also a yes. And with these parameters, okay, now I've got to ask. But yeah. if you have to ask for every single gig, it, it really, I mean, it makes the process terrible for the person. Dude, who's got imagine for 10 people. Right, right. And oh, one yeah, person can veto it and then, right. So the point I'm getting to here is that we, I got one that was a little bit out of the norm of our agreement and it was far away. And, um, other very good bands in the area have taken this gig. And I talked to the leaders of those bands and they were like, yeah, you know, there's a little bit of a built in audience. You got to do some hustle yourself, you know, do some Facebook advertising, get the word out, you know, do what you can to get the word out. And, you know, you can build an audience there. Um, And so I, and we, and the offer was for the door. Right. And so that's why I brought it back to the, to the band and said, you know, here's what the deal is. So there was um, some guys like, yeah, let's try it. There were some guys that were like, too much risk for too much travel, not worth it to me. Um, and then really where it came down to was like, you know, I agree that developing a new geography is good for us. That's something we should want to do. But the way to do that is get as much as you can for the time, for the bang, for the buck. So try and get two or three gigs, you know, over a three or four day period yeah. and figure out if there's a way to motel six it or something like that. But this, you know, immediately kind of like, A, it's hard enough to get one gig. So three or four gigs, you know, to plan a little mini tour in a very specific area. That's really, really, you know, it's not easy to get done. Right. No, especially if you don't have a name for yourself or you've That's never right. been to that area. Even if you have a name for yourself in one place, it doesn't mean that that necessarily translates. You have to sell that properly. And then yeah. you're dealing with schedules for the clubs, trying to coordinate all that. It's, it's my it's point. A, exactly. It's a major headache planning a tour. Even a yeah, even w- a three night tour or whatever, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so I would love to hear how your friend actually got you know basically a three night tour you know on vacation. Did yeah. she have connections already? Did she just say, "Hey, I'm from the states and I got some great musicians." You know, you interested in us playing for the door? You know, so it was no risk on their part. Yep. Uh, you know, that'd be it'd be fun to know. I mean, well, can I, you I tell send you what, her, when we, send when her we a post note. This, and, yeah, when we post this episode. I'm pretty sure she's a member of our Gig Gab Facebook group at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. And I'll tag her and say, hey, tell us more. And maybe maybe we'll have her on the show. She's great. But she's she's a super go getter. Like, you know, just like you. Right. She is always working the angle to and not in a but not in a bad way, like in a very friendly way. But she's always in the back of her mind. Like working to make sure, okay, like this could be a gig opportunity. This could be a gig yeah. opportunity. Like none of us had ever played that Hampton Beach clamshell this summer. And she's like, oh yeah, I've been, I've been working on this for like three years. And uh, she's like, it's all, I've always wanted to play here. And she's like, so I was going to make it happen. It's like, Whoa. Okay, cool. And I'm just going to like gush a little bit here. So much love and respect for that attitude, because literally that is that conversation I had about the gigs in a nutshell, like the, the kind of jaded, um, uh, the, the musician who is constantly making the time for money, um, uh, calculation misses the opportunity of the investment. Right. And you know, what you find is, is that as, and I understand from whence it comes, from where it comes is that, you know, you've been a musician for a while and you basically say, 
this is this is money on my on my table, I mean, food on my table. I can do take a risk on that, or I can take a you know a fairly regular thing, or not take the risk or the hassle. But really, th- nothing happens unless somebody is willing to blow down doors and create opportunity. Praise now, to the go getters, man! Absolutely, it, it, and, 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 and your, your ability to sell it to your to your band is another thing too. Like, yeah. I'm I'm okay at that. Like, I can I can win the day often. There are times when sometimes where I think something is really good for the band and I have some pretty, you know, differentiating views on that. I don't win every time. I don't win as much as I'd like to. And maybe my expectations are too high for myself. But those people who blow down doors and create opportunities and have vision for a cool, different way of doing things. You, you do praise to the go getters. I mean, it is it. Nothing happens unless somebody has a vision to go get something. So that, that's I think that's awesome. I'm I would love to do what your friend have done. Just well, see, I go think somewhere. In, in order to do it, you have to just you have it for her clearly, and she has a band, right? Probably yeah. reached out to her band first and said, sure. hey, you guys want to do this? And they said no. Now, I, I happen to know their keyboard player. He goes on this uh, cruise to the edge thing every year, which is a total prog rock cruise on a cruise ship somewhere. And yes, plays. But so does every other prog band that you've never heard of. And I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I, I'm a prog geek. So like I follow his posts while he's there. You know, it, I definitely live vicariously. living vicariously. Through yeah. Him. yeah. But but that just happened to be on the same week that she was doing this. So my guess is that was sort of the well. You know, her band wasn't available. Her band wasn't available. Uh, at least one member of her band went, the bass player. Her old drummer who moved away went. Um, but it was, you know, she opened it up and said, okay, I can't bring my band. It's just not feasible for, you know, logistics or maybe money or maybe all of the above. And so I'm just going to pick, I'm going to throw together a pickup band and we're going to uh-huh. go play Honky Tonk Woman and, and you, uh-huh. you know, whatever. And it, we're going to have a blast. And they, I mean- from the videos that they posted, they looked like they had more than a blast, man. It looked awesome. Yeah. Have you ever done that where you've gone away with with a band for the weekend or anything like that? Well, I haven't, but there's two things. So one, this is actually happening to us essentially, right? So our friend Bob has said he wants to get our Macro to Ulster band back together. and So we're going to talk about this publicly. All right, here it is. The cat's out of the here bag. Here it is. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the members of our band who, you know, really loves what we do um, has been wanting to get a reunion show together. You know, we all live in different parts of the country and all these types of things. And uh, he happened to post a video from the last, one of the last things we did together. And there was some good love coming back on it. And uh, that got his wheels turning and he just figured out a way to make it happen. And he's going to you know put something together to get us all together. Um, you know, there's some th- thoughts about whether there should be like Kickstarter, or, or GoFundMe type, you know, support to get the people off to fly in, you know, paid for. There's um, some thought about adding like a little tech conference to it. I mean, they, you know, the wheels are turning. But again, you, like you said, props to the go-getters. Bob was a go-getter. He Bob's, really wanted this to happen. Yep. Yep. So save the date, so, January 26, 2019. Yeah. That's if the, anybody wants to see us do our thing. Yeah. Could be interesting. In San Francisco. Yeah. San Francisco, <laughs> it's always interesting. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But, um, you know, have I ever gone away? No. However... The desire for me to play uh, some more bar band rock and roll stuff different than what the house rockers do has overcome me. And I actually just did the thing. You know, I, I've been doing really good with these PK and friends kind of one off gigs that I do. And so I'm going to do a PK and friends classic rock night called some buddies and just said, here's a song list. No rehearsal. Just show up and be ready to do it. <sighs> and the guys who I know will do it. And it's going to be you know kind of casual, but it's what it's meant to be. But it's bar band stuff. And I know the guys I've called, you know, it's uh, what do you call it? Rock and roll fake book stuff. Yeah. Right. Three chords in the truth. So, so yeah, three chords in the truth. And so that model of stuff is really fun. I mean, the, you know, the really like diligently rehearsed you know, meticulous stuff that the house rockers kind of are doing a lot of that. Right. But, um, you know, I'd love to play a whole night of rock and roll. So again, just using this little off brand that I've created PK and friends night of classic rock. And we're going to, we're going to dig into that. So, um, so I guess I could say to the guys, Hey, this is kind of fun. You want to go to Costa Rica <laughs> right? right? and figure out if there's a model there. Cause well, that's it. literally it's PK and friends in Costa Rica, right? Yeah. There I mean, go. it's it, like I said, if you're just true to that rock and roll fake book, you know, you can do that. And uh, if you have a little bit of a 
you've got enough boxy to pick up the phone or, you know, send an email and say, Hey, you know, want something different in your club? You know, we can make it happen. There must be a reason why the, these, this bar in Costa Rica was open to this idea. I mean, there, my, a, guess, there's is, probably my guess is Suzanne musicians knows them. In, my guess well, is she, she's made, made acquaintances there with the bar that's owners it. and all that in the past. Like, I'm sure this wasn't just the, you know, the first spark of this idea, my guess did not happen six months ago. It happened probably six years ago for her. Sure. And so she's just been like, Oh, it'd be cool. Maybe someday, you know, she's having a drink at the local bar near her vacation house, whatever it is, y- you know, says, I have a band. Yeah. I'd love to, you know, that'd be cool someday. Wouldn't it be cool? And the bar owner says, yeah, that'd be cool. Now you've already <laughs> got buy-in, you know what I mean? And then you come back to them two years later and you're like, so remember that idea that you loved, I'm going to make it happen for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And they're they're done. Right. How can they say no? Yep. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, um, I think it's a really cool thing. It probably does start with a, with a connection that you milk for a long time or you nurture for a long time. You've and got to have an anchor real. when you go on tour, you know, we, we never really did it with go figure, which is the college band I was in, but we started to, and it was the booking of that tour that, that really kind of tore the band apart. Uh, that, there was a college circuit at that time, right? Yeah, I think in a sense there still is. I mean, I still see people really? playing at a lot of the clubs, but we built like a, uh, I say we, I, I, I do not want to even pretend to take credit for this. My friend Jeff, who was our singer, uh, did the the heavy lifting and then, uh, you know, it of course all fell apart. But um, he looked at, you know, clubs, he, he knew what places you know might take a band like ours and so we call them in clubs like the eight by ten in baltimore i mean these you know these sort of staple clubs that take bands and and uh and so he found these anchors and he you know he booked i think two of them it was like a two-week tour that we were going to do and he had two or three of them and then it was like okay great now i can call the clubs in between and tell them I have a gig at the eight by 10 in Baltimore. I have a gig at Toad's place in New Haven, even though that was right near where yep. we lived. Didn't matter. Right. Like you can start saying names that might, you know, give a little credibility, to your a argument. Little credibility. Exactly. And, you yeah. know, we've played at the university of Connecticut for years and we've done this and we won this battle of the bands and we did this, or wh- you know, whatever it is. And now you can say, great. So we're there on that Friday night, but I want to play your place on the Wednesday prior. And it's like, okay, yeah, no problem. You know, you work out whatever the finances are and then boom. And now you have a tour. That's it. Um, So, yeah, there you go. And again, remember, it's different for college kids with no ties and no day jobs and, you know, different types of significant other things. And that's part of the thing is like we're talking about guys with, you know, lives and wives. and, And so the planning of something like this is a... I don't know. I always thought it would be kind of cool along the concept of, you know, doing the Airbnb thing is like everybody go in and bring their families and, you know, we'll just happen to try and offset some costs, yeah. some of the costs, you know, on a couple of the evenings. But uh, but everybody has different amounts of time and everybody has different. Actually, people have different amounts of interest in leaving their home when you get a little older. They yep. have different amounts of interest in you know sleeping in a different bed. I mean, there's all sorts of moving. Well, and there's, you know. Um, when you go away with a band, we did, I mean, obviously I was on, on the road with hypnotic clambake for a while, but we did, uh, a couple of weekends away where we would get hired to play in like some tourist trap somewhere. Uh, and we did those with go figure, which was the band I was in in college. And you know, we had like, when we did the first one, we had been together for years. Some of us had played together in high school, you, you know, I mean, it went way back and, uh, and yet. You know, once you're like stuck in like the club's bunkhouse together with, you know, Hmm. those guys for a weekend, uh, that's enough. There's a different <laughs> level of tolerance required to make it through that. And it's a learning experience. Right. So, and I'm sure that to spend a week together, I assume that, that this band, they called it trouble T R U B B L E. Um, like, I think they live, all lived in, like, they just rented a big house. That's what it looked like from all these videos. Yeah. My guess is they learned something about living with each other that they did not intend to learn at the outset as well. There's, there's a risk there, isn't there? Yep. There sure is. 
there's a risk. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the understatement of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess in the, in the scale of good to practical to you know difficult, the best is if somebody else is paying the bill and puts everybody in their own hotel room and you, you know it. then it's then it's a true vacation. If you're hacking this together to try and find a formula that works for you, you know you again it's what stage of life you're in and you know can guys cohabitate together like that and yep. snoring and, and uh, sloppiness or neatness and all that type of stuff, you know, can, it actually could end up being stressful. I guess it's a really good point to, to, you know, bring out is like the rosy, wouldn't it be great to all, for us all to go hang out in the tropics and, and play some music together. You know, once you peel that back a little bit, there's a few things you got to think about. Yeah. I, I, I remember so, and I forget who it was that said it, but, um, but somebody described the road as, uh, the most important thing you can do every day is manage the 22 hours of downtime that you have mm. because th like, it, don't worry about like the music, presumably that's going to take care of itself. You've already got that covered. Now here's the challenge. 22 free hours a day. Go, you know, no money, <laughs> not mm. where you want to be. You're not with any of your support structure other than your band. And your band will simultaneously be, be your support structure as well as like your sworn mortal enemies. And, uh, and you got to figure it out. Yeah. So, you know, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting stuff. So, hey. uh, I had a cool gig on Saturday night. Just want to jump yeah, right no, in. That's where I was going to jump to. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So the house rockers played our local club and we had a you know, really good crowd and, um, it's really fun, uh, as our new drummer is easing, rapidly into a very comfortable spot the funnest part of all of it like you know we're starting with a, a base of songs that he pretty much knew from his subbing time with us um and then some of the stuff that we've been getting him up to speed on all of a sudden some of the songs that i was really dead tired of playing are different they're new you know the, the grooves are different the beats are different and uh it's it like the energy that the band got from that was really really cool so even simple things like like superstition or smooth um you know joe would play them one way and russ plays them a different way not better or worse just different yep but the energy from feeling kind of a rebirth to material that you felt a little tired on is was is really kind of fun and so I, I've shared this many times. I had no idea, you know, the unique chemistry dynamics history that my band had, even introducing a new guy that we all liked. Yep. I'd like to have believed that it was going to be good, but you never know. You know, you never, you never really know if, if it was going to grab people in a different way, because that kind of chemistry is a big part of our vibe, right? I, it's totally part of it, but, but not to discount just the, the feel changes that, that you're going to yep. have with a different drummer. I've, I've experienced, I always like that. You know, when I go in, I know that the first gig with a new band or a sub gig that everybody's going to, I mean, as long as I don't, you know, show up and screw up, but if I show up and do my job, everybody's going to love me. But the reason they're going to love me is these songs that, like you said, they were, you know, be had become a little bit routine now are just a just different enough that they yeah. feel like everything's and they, You know, a lot of times you'd be like, wow, you're way better than our. No, nah, I'm really not. I'm just different. <laughs> it, like, don't sell yourself unless I want them to sell themselves. Then I just <laughs> shut up and let them convince themselves. But gush themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But otherwise, it's like, no, no, dude, like your other drummer is actually great. It, it's that you're used to him. You're not used yeah. to me. So you're paying attention. This is new for you. And that's cool. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's fun. And it, it makes, and, and you could tell that from that, the energy that goes around the stage has been really positive. So we had, we had a really fun gig. I mean, just the vibe was, I mean, it was a good crowd. It was like one of those nights, the, st the, the stars lined up uh, yeah. and, uh, and I even, N you know, Nirvana tossed, night, we call that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I even, uh, things were going so good. I decided to see if I could wreck it. And I said, Hey Russ, you, you okay if I go off script a little bit and do something you haven't done with us before? And he was like, uh, he looked at me for a second. He goes, let's do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and then we jumped in and it was all good. So what, what did you, what, what curveball did you throw? I always love roller coaster or something like that. And not, oh, not yeah. that it's a hard song, just it's, it's he'd never done first, it with us right? before. Yep. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the other stuff we're working really hard. Russ has um, been really smart. So my message to him in the beginning was, I'm going to go at the speed I go. It's up to you to tell me when you need to put the brakes on and, you know, when you need some more time. And, you know, he finally waved the flag after a while. And he was like, listen, um, 
a run through with me does not mean I have it. I want more reps on these things. So he insisted, you know, he, he, he did what he needed to make himself successful. Smart. And so he's, yeah, he just, and again, that's a, you have to be, uh, you have to have trust that you can have that conversation, even if you're the new guy. So I think that, that that's a win for all of us that we've, ex- we've, we've created yeah, a, yeah, the fact a, a that vibe. he felt comfortable saying, yeah. I need to do it again. Yeah. But you still got to say it, right? So you props to, to him say for it, saying, right? yeah, yeah, you got to stand up for yourself. You know, get what you need to be successful is what I would say. And um, so he's pausing that. And it just means we do a couple more reps in rehearsal and a little bit less, just slow down the introducing the stuff he still has to catch up on for a little while. And it's, it's clearly paying dividends because this gig was really, really fun. So nice. I'm really enthusiastic. Our summer uh, schedule is, which was very Every year, I think we're going to get rotated out of some of the gigs we've had for a long time. Sure. We did lose a couple of them, but it, it's starting to fill in a little bit better now. So I'm feeling, I'm feeling really, you know, positive about the quantity of work we'll have between May and September. Uh, so we have a lot, there's a lot of good things going in our direction right now. That's great, man. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really about glad it. to hear that. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. you're gonna love Russ. I can't. You'll, you will have to find some time. You know, you're, when your life takes you out here. Yeah. But um, he's just a great guy. Obviously, spectacular drummer, smart guy. He's a he's a middle school teacher. You know, for his ah, day job. Very cool. And uh, just good communicator, and you know, terrific musician. And he's adding in ways I I couldn't even have thought that he would add. And, you know, part of it is just the bro vibe is just staying at the level that I love. And part of it is, you know, the musicianship is, you know, again, it's not better or worse. It's just, uh, there's a freshness to it that a new guy, that's what a new guy should bring in no matter what instrument it is. Yes. A new, like a reinvigorated attitude or, you know, something. But if you're a new guy in any band, you will kind of want to, you know, in addition, you've, you've been hired for your chops, but what makes it a great engagement is is if you bring, you know, a, a, a new enthusiasm or a new perspective or new ways to do things that work with your band. Again, you don't want to walk in and say, hey, in my old band, I used to do it this way. That's it's sure almost a sure sign of death. But um, yeah, unless it's but, unless it's like you just, you know, you're playing 15 songs and in one of them you say, hey. Uh, you know, like, especially if it's if if it train wrecks a little bit for for one reason or another, or the end doesn't seem tight, you know, at that point. And again, it's got to be the right vibe in the room and everybody's got to have that, you know, sort of mutual tr- trust and mutual love. But, mm-hmm. you know, I found it where it's like, hey, can we just try it this way? And if everybody's got that open mind, sometimes that one little change to the tune now starts to make it ours instead of the previous thing that the new guy needs to learn. You know what I mean? Well, let me back up then. So, so the deal is understanding when to say, can we try it this way? Totally. Oh yeah. In your, if you you come in in your first rehearsal, you will definitely get people in your band saying, you know, but you haven't learned the stuff we asked you to learn yet. Right. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Right. Dude. Dude. (laughs) Dude. (laughs) So, yeah. Hey, I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about, uh, I know we just have a little bit of time, but um I've been reflecting on something that Acoustic Madness is doing. So it's our trio and it's about, it's about how groove and rhythm are still, even in acoustic gigs huh. where you're strumming cowboy chords, groove and rhythm are still a thing, oh, you know, more so I think. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, explain what you mean, but I have, I, I probably could go another three hours on this particular topic, especially after all the different people that I've played with over the last like four weeks here, but, but go ahead. I I have more to say. All right. So I noticed when, even though we're an acoustic trio, two guitars, three singers, um, people will get up and try and dance sometimes. Um, and it's interesting to, you know, you can tell when people are kind of grabbing onto a rhythm. So, uh, there are grooves in all, in all music, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it's kind of what grabs you to most popular music is, you know, even if it's metal or whatever it is, it, there's something in a good song that you have a, a physical reaction to your body reacts to, a, you know, a good song and that's the groove. And I, I notice from time to time when people get up to dance to acoustic music that they have good intentions, but they can't find something to kind of lock onto. Yep. And it's not because there's not a drummer. It's not because of that at all. It's because, at least with guitar players, you have to be conscious that, that there is still a groove to be had. You know, it's very easy to just kind of whack around on, on cowboy chords and uh, you know, 
you're technically playing the song and you still have the melody sitting on top, whatever you're singing, but is that groove there? And you, you understand that this is what producers do, right? They, right. they, they very consciously make sure that there's consistency of groove. Now that said, Psychoto, Steve, who I play with is a friggin' metronome. I mean, he is, he is fantastically consistent, clean playing guitar player. That's right. Great. That's what you, and, but you need that in an acoustic well, that's setting. It. Like, I'm, and I actually the, find that I can use him as a percussion point. I, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to play the same part to him all the time. Totally. He's so freaking steady. I can do things and, you know, feel like a lot of creative freedom because that groove, he sets it. And like I said, he, he's like a drummer. You, he's well, so freaking consistent. You have to. So in any acoustic outfit where there's acoustic guitar, at least one of the acoustic guitars is serving the role of the drummer a hundred percent of the time. And if you're the only acoustic guitar player in your acoustic outfit, that's you, whether, yeah. whether you know it or not, it's you. And, and I, I've always said like when I play with, uh, with monkey fist, you know, when I uh, started playing with him, it was always the same lineup. It was Johnny D singing, Jimmy playing guitar. And then uh, me, uh, I started just doing congas and stuff. And then eventually I got that pitch slap that I can stand and wear. And that's way better. So I generally still use that, but it doesn't matter what I'm playing. I am accompaniment, even though what I'm playing, especially on like the Cajon sounds kind of like a drum set. I am not driving the groove. I am right. following Jimmy. I am playing along with him, but he's driving it. And, um, and that's how it has to be because if you don't have that, like I, and, and it really, it's a mindset thing. I mean, certainly there's a mm. technique thing to it and you need to be able to keep time and you need to be, like confident in your ability, not just to keep time, but drive the time. Um, but you have to play it like a drummer and you have to play it. Like you want people's feet to tap along. And I'm talking yep. about, I'm not talking about somebody sitting there and playing, you know, like jazz guitar lightly in the corner that that requires groove of a different kind of a different kind. Yep. Or classical music or, you know, somebody playing flamenco guitar or whatever. Again, they all have, there is a groove to classical music too, just like there is to flamenco. But if you're out there playing rock tunes, uh, acoustic style, you need to drive them as though you are the drummer, not absolutely. And this is the important part. Not as though you're playing along with the drummer you hear in your head. Because so two perfect examples of this. So two songs that I do that are the litmus test about whether we're getting our job done. Me and Julio. Yep. And uh, Folsom Fr Prison Blues, right? Yeah. So if if you are playing these acoustically and people can't find a groove to dance to, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, I, I noticed that. I mean, there's I, a bounce to me and Julio that is just a very natural thing. If you respect the groove that has been in that song, it's just, you know, the, the progression, the emphasis, the way the melody sits on top of it. You know, it is a great dance song, right? And similarly, Folsom is a country song. And you hear in your mind, you hear that alternating bass, you know, that is yeah. so prevalent in country music. Yep. And so, but if you just start whacking away and just start strumming, strumming, you know, madly, even though you are technically in time, if you are not giving people a groove to hang on to, you're being sloppy with your plan. You have to communicate the time. Yeah. I, it's funny because we were talking about that that gig last week where I said, you know, it was like Nirvana night versus fight night, I think was the the, the section. <laughs> and I said the songs that felt the best were tunes where the guitar naturally – like the guitar part even on the recording – is the natural driver. And I think it was that sister Hazel tune, the all for you. Right. Yeah. And, um, and uh, deep blue, something's Bre breakfast at Tiffany's, right. These are songs where the acoustic guitar, even in the context of a full rock band is still the driving force. And those went over great and felt great. And the rest, I mean, there was, you know, there were various highs and lows, but as I was thinking more about it, it's like, Oh yeah. Well, like those are the songs where the guitar players, just know to drive it. And, and me and Julio is another one, right? Like that song is totally guitar driven. Uh, the, the drums, you listen to that, that Central Park concert where, where Paul Simon and Garfunkel played, you know, back in the 80s uh -huh. or whatever. And I mean, the drummer, if you listen to the drum part of that, there's almost nothing happening. I mean, there's like a little groove. Actually, there's a lot happening, but it's accompaniment, right? It's not the drive of, of the guitar because it's right there. And that's, that's what you have to have in order for acoustic rock music to succeed. Yeah, for so sure. So I'd, I'd encourage everybody to look up um, on the web. Uh, there's a small kind of mini 
um, acoustic show or a section of a Prince show. And he does Cream and two or three others. And just the first song is Cream. And I think you can find that alone. But um, just he's so funky, even if it's just him yeah. and an acoustic player and just, they pan the crowd and you see the crowd bopping along with just one guy and an acoustic guitar. That is kind of the goal. I mean, even, even, you know, no matter what song, you know, there's a groove in there. And, um, that's a little bit of the discipline about playing things, uh, professionally, right. Yep. There's a groove in everything. And, uh, you, you know, you, you, when you play solo acoustic, you have to resist the temptation to fill space by over strumming, you know, in, in, in finger picking guitar, in like a Travis picking style, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a metronome feel to, to finger pick guitars, right. Um, alternating bass notes, that type of thing. Yeah. That's groove. That's, that's all part of groove. And that's totally kind of what people groove. react to in this stuff. So I, like I said, the, the, the brain deadest, simplest one for me is me and Julio. If I'm, if I'm trying to show how how much dynamic I have with my guitar playing and filling up a lot of space or that type of thing, people get up and dance and they can't find a groove to dance to. It's me. It's not yep. them. Keep it simple. Just drive the bus, drive that quarter note. I noticed when I uh, started playing guitar that my time was awful, like <laughs> really bad. And it was it was like it was embarrassing to myself. I mean, I wasn't playing in front of people, so it wasn't like this was a problem. I'm like, why can't I do this? Like I sit down at a drum set. I'm not perfect, but like I can hold a band together and, and you know, like I'm, I'm capable, I'm competent. And I realize it's because you have to feel it in your body and playing the guitar is a very different thing from playing the drums physically. And so getting that finding where I could feel that groove in my body playing guitar was like, Oh, okay. And it, it was, but it was a very intentional thing, even coming from someone who like, you know, I've been feeling the groove of my body for 30 years and perfecting that. Um, and, and it was like, Nope, I have to re like think about intentionally, like where can it be at all times? Like starting to play the drums. It took me a little while to figure this out. I mean, it actually was a drum teacher that pointed it out. He's like, look, you got to learn to feel the groove in your body. But initially I just want you keeping time on the hi-hat. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, you don't, you don't have to keep the hi-hat going. But he's like, but you know, bang the, the heel of your foot down on the quarter notes or the eighth notes, whatever fits in the groove. And don't change that. He's like, that's going to be your rock. And Pulse. trust me. Yeah. You, you need to feel it in order to deliver it. And if you're not feeling it, 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 like, how could you possibly communicate that to someone else? And, uh, and so I had to like, thankfully I remembered that lesson and I, so I was like, okay, where in my body can I feel this? And it's like, it's kind of that, that, you know, for me, it's that upper shoulder, like right shoulder kind of thing. And I can just kind of like, keep that going, no matter what's actually happening with my hand, my body's just kind of moving and it's like, okay, yeah, now I've got the groove and I'm obviously not, a, well, not obviously I am not a great guitar player, but if you give me a guitar, I'm good for, you know, six to 10 songs in front of a crowd and I can drive mm -hmm. the groove on every one of them. Uh, actually, I'm probably good for more than that, but that's the, like, that, that would be overstaying my welcome anyway. So groove is everything. Groove is everything. Yeah. Grooves in the heart, right? Wasn't that the tune? <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, but yeah. <laughs> hey, one last thing I wanted to yeah. share. Um, uh, there is an, this is for all my guitar brothers out there. There's, um, really an explosion of luthiers and guitar manufacturers happening in the world right now. And, and I, uh, my local guitar shop who I've talked about here on the show, Keith Holland guitars, um, he started carrying a line called Eastman guitars. And I bought one of these guitars, uh, right around Christmas time. It's a, it's a Gibson 335 style guitar under a thousand dollars and the fit and finish in this guitar are absolutely incredible. I've been loving playing it. I love the tone of it. I mean, it's really, a, you know, what, what would be a $4,000 guitar, you know, from the the famous manufacturer I got for under a thousand dollars and I'm loving playing for it. Wow. And, uh, there's just, the, you know, in acoustic guitars, there's, there's all sizes. There's the guys who put out 10 guitars a year and you're paying, you know, six, eight, ten thousand dollars for them. There's medium sized luthiers that are putting out some number more than those. And you can get for under 2000, sometimes under a thousand dollars that are really, really good. Um, go Dan as a, as a, a Canadian manufacturer that now has an acoustic line 
that's really reasonably priced. And again, the craftsmanship is really, really superb. They're called Art and Luthery is the Godin um, acoustic line. My point is, is um, there are so many quality options out there for cool guitars now um, made by manufacturers you might know of. Um, Heritage is another is another brand that's making some really fantastic Gibson-like guitars. But uh, I just want to say I've been using this Eastman guitar. Uh, it's called T486, which is a, you know, it's a body style and general vibe of a Gibson 335. And I am just blown away by thing, you know, is rock solid, stays in tune. Intonation is perfect. Tone, you know, both you know both both settings um are fantastic and again i paid under a thousand dollars for this guitar brand i am new. loving playing brand new yeah. loving loving playing playing this guitar that's awesome man i it, you know it's always great to hear uh you know hear a musician get so excited about like a new instrument yeah. or whatever yeah 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 oh man i'm glad that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, I just want to encourage people go out and look under different rocks than you might have when you want looking for a new sound. And that's actually the reason I bought this is that I just wanted a different sound for the house rockers this year. Uh, you know, I play tellies, you know, almost exclusively and, sure. you know, I love my tellies and, and, you know, the first couple of gigs, I use the Eastman for the whole show. Last gig, I use the Eastman for the first set and I use my telly for the second set and a little bit organize the set list to, you know, like I put the Springsteen stuff in the second set when I would knew I would be using the telly, that type of thing. But, um, you know, for for funk rhythm, it's fantastic. Uh, for driving rock, it's very good. For blues, it's fantastic. It's, you know, it's got humbuckers, and so it's beautiful, thick sound. Um, and it's just different from what I had. And that's what started it. Yep. I didn't really want to, you know, go all in on a Gibson. Um, uh, and so I played this, played it in the music store a couple times, loved it. And then, you know, pulled the trigger, and I was just so happy with it. There are... For guitar players, there are so many cool options out there that are different than the standard name brands, uh, both acoustic and electric. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about this as we go on. And I'm sure on our social media pages, people kind of share what finds they had. But I'm just going to wave a flag and say Eastman rocks. That's great, man. Yeah, it's it. It really is, especially now. Like there's we understand what it took to make those guitars and drums and everything else that, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, were like super happy accidents, right? Like there was, and, and I, I don't mean to say that these companies didn't put work into these things, but some of these things that they made worked sure. out really well, sure. you, you know, and, and, but we've sort of digested that and dissected it and figured out, okay, so here are the elements that actually made that good. And some of it is, you know, like with amps, especially it's like, well, you know, if you like bother to wrap the tubes the right way and all of that, as opposed to having a machine do it, it actually sounds better, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but we know these things and there are tons of, of small cottage industries, you know, where people or cottage businesses, I should say, where people have figured this out and make these great things. I don't I, I don't mean to say that Eastman is a small little cottage business, but it's smaller than Gibson. And yep. and they figured out how to do this one thing. Well, they do it. They have perfected it. They're there to support you. And, and it really is worth looking, if especially if you know you want something a lot like what that brand name thing is. Um, if, if the brand name itself isn't a priority to you, then yeah, take a little bit of time and search. Cause you might find something even better. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. So cool. That's all I got today, man. I made it through the show. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm leaned up against a heating pad, of course, but you know, that's just <laughs> how it goes. <laughs> That's my life. You need to go relax and you need to heal up. So hopefully when we talk next week, you'll be in a, you'll be in a better place. Uh, I will be for sure. It's, it can't, right. it can't get, well, I was going to say it can't get worse. <laughs> it was worse. A you know, it ago. should. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're hoping it doesn't get worse. All right, folks, that's, uh, that's what we got for this one. So thanks so much for hanging out with us. Make sure you check us out. Uh, giggabpodcast.com. No matter what, always be performing. Always. See what I did there with the no matter what. I saw week, that. The fake yeah, ending no, was pretty good. Yeah, right? no matter what you do. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Take it easy. Late. Late.